I don't know if you've looked yet in your bulletin to see the title of today's sermon, <clears throat> but if you did, I'm willing to bet that you just could not wait to get to it. Wise administration and accountability. The eighth characteristic of a healthy church, according to Dr. Stephen Machia. Administration. Woohoo! <laughs> you know, preaching about worship excites me. Preaching about evangelism excites me. Discipleship excites me. Administration gives me headaches. <laughs> and when I first read Machia's book years ago, I thought that I would find this chapter on administration and accountability uh, boring and dry. But just imagine my surprise when I fell in love with this chapter after reading just the first sentence of the second paragraph. Machia writes, frankly, we should not expect pastors to be good administrators. <laughs> huh? So I kept reading and this is what he says. Seminary did not train them in administration, and few have the experience in it or the God-given gift of administration. So pastors today need to recognize when they are not gifted in administration. By the second page, I was stomping my feet, and I was raising my hands, and I was saying, Amen, preach it, Dr. Machia. Well, then I, I did some looking in the scriptures, and I turned to Acts chapter 6. So if you'll turn there with me. Uh, I experienced some joy reading this passage as I found out I was in some very good company. Acts chapter 6, we're going to be reading over all verses 1 through 7, but we're going to start with the first two verses. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Even the apostles, the ones who had walked with Jesus, found themselves burdened, overburdened, by the duties of administration. Uh, the New Living Translation states uh, the second verse, we apostles should spend our times preaching and teaching the word of God, not administering a food program. And Luke, Luke wrote Acts. He mentions two groups of Christians here. He mentions uh, the Greek-speaking Jews and the Hebrew-speaking Jews. So these were all Christians, but they were all uh, Jews who had converted to Christianity. And the Greek-speaking Jews were Jews that lived outside of Judea for whatever reason. And what would happen is sometimes in their old age, Jews who lived outside of Jerusalem would move to Jerusalem so they could be buried there when they died. And if they were by themselves, they had no one to take care of them. And so they were dependent on Jewish, or in this case, Christian charity, just to provide for their daily needs. And there was some grumbling about that going on in this early Christian community. For whatever reason, the Greek-speaking disciples felt that their widows were being overlooked. Now, maybe they were being overlooked. Maybe their perception of inequality was simply off. But what we know is they grumbled, and it caused problems. Now, I actually find that heartening, to know that there have been troubles in the church from the very beginning. That even if the apostles had to deal with problems and discontent, it's ridiculous for us to assume that we will never have to deal with problems and discontent. But the issues here went beyond just the grumbling of some of the disciples. Because of this food administration program, the apostles were not able to give the time and the effort they needed to prayer and to preaching and to teaching about Jesus Christ. And as I said, there have always been these problems in the church. And when we face a problem, we can fix it or we can ignore it. And when we fix a problem, the church becomes healthier. And if we ignore a problem, the church becomes unhealthier. And so here we have the apostles facing a problem. 
They were overburdened by administrative duties and were being uh, taken away from their primary tasks of preaching and teaching. Now keep in mind, they were not belittling the food ministry. They were not saying this hands-on stuff is unimportant. The opposite is true. It is so important, they said, that if we keep running it, people will suffer. If the apostles had to keep running this food program, then some people who needed food would get overlooked. And then on the other hand, some people would not have the opportunity to hear and respond to the word of God because the apostles would be too busy uh, dealing with administration. The modern pastor faces a very similar problem. Machia writes, 50 years ago, which actually since the time of the writing of the book, we'll say 65 years ago, the demand on pastors was much simpler. They were called to the basic tasks of preaching and teaching the Bible, calling on the sick and bereaved, being available for emergencies, having basic financial management skills, and shepherding the people through all the seasons of life. Today, Machia says, the expectations are outstripping the best of us with the ever-expanding needs of congregations for multi-talented servants of Christ who are, now listen to this list, excellent communicators, trained psychotherapists, theologians and philosophers who can address the pertinent issues of the day in an intellectual fashion, have the ability to serve as a small group leader, be a social worker for the detailed real life cases presented each week, financial wizard and fundraiser, have the ability to speak into the unchurched secular mind of the day and convince them with the gospel. Let's see, I lost myself, this list is so long. Uh, serve as a futurist and strategic thinker, manage the overall organization and the many programs offered in the church, and at the same time have a healthy marriage and two or more wonderfully talented children. <laughs> and I could add a whole bunch of stuff to that list from my own experience. But let me tell you, that pastor does not exist. Um, uh, pastoral search committee members in here, that pastor doesn't exist. Even if Tim Keller or Francis Chan or Andy Stanley called you and said, hey, I want to come here as your pastor, even those heavy hitters cannot do all of that. And we're touching on some common themes here that I've preached about before in the last 10 or so weeks. And a couple of those common themes are going to come up again today because of the text we're preaching from. But many of the problems that the current modern church faces is because pastors are unable to attend to the basic ministries of prayer and preaching and teaching. And when a pastor cannot do what God has called them to do, which is preaching, teaching, and as we talked about several weeks ago, um, enabling you, equipping you to do hands-on ministry, then everyone suffers. The church suffers and the community suffers because what happens is because of a lack of preparation, a lack of time to pray, preaching and teaching become subpar. And when preaching and teaching become subpar, unbelievers don't come to Christ. And current believers don't have the chance to grow in their faith. What continues to happen is that the pastor burns out and the entire church becomes unhealthy. Now, there is a way around these problems. And this is another theme that's popped up in my preaching with you over the last two and a half months is the scripture texts seem to raise a problem and then they give us a way to deal with it. So back to cha uh, Acts chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Luke does not use the word deacon here, but this is where we are introduced to the office of deacon. Now, that doesn't mean that those of you who are not deacons get to tune me out 
for the rest of the sermon because the truths of the passage apply to all of us. But these men were chosen to lead and to do the hands-on work of the food ministry and to see that it was done fairly so that the apostles could focus their time and energy on praying, preaching, and teaching. And my guess is, going by the description of, of what these men had to be in terms of being uh, well-respected and, and full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom, is that even they, the seven of them, did not try to do this all themselves. I am willing to bet that they recruited under leaders and put together teams. Because if, if you remember the sermon from a few weeks ago, on Pentecost, the church went pretty much in one moment from 120 to 3,120. So seven men can't take care of 3,000 people. So as wise administrators, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to put my money on it that, that these men recruited other leaders and put together other teams. And William Barclay, a long time ago, wrote, it's extremely interesting to note that the first office bearers to which we are introduced and who were appointed were chosen not to talk, but for practical service. If the church is going to be Christ, then both speaking and hands-on ministry are necessary. Maybe you remember last week when I told you how excited I was that Scripture says Jesus came preaching. It excites me that Jesus was a preacher. But he was also a hands-on practical servant. And he makes that clear in Matthew 20, 28, when he says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. These seven men were both servants and administrators. They served by taking on the leadership and administration of this hands-on food ministry. Now here's another common thread that's come up in the preaching several times. God prepares all of us for some type of ministry. And I hope you can do a little better job than the first service, and I know I got that's on film, but... Uh, how does God prepare us for ministry? By giving us gifts, spiritual gifts. God prepares us for ministry by giving everyone spiritual gifts. And the church functions best when everyone is allowed and able and willing to use the gifts that God has given them. When we try to fit square pegs into a round hole, the church becomes unhealthy. If we try to fit too many pegs into the same hole, as in the case of a church where all the expectations fall on the pastor, then the church becomes unhealthy. So God gives every congregation people gifted in administration. And based on the text we're preaching from today, the way I'm defining administration is leading and doing hands-on ministry that frees other Christians to use their gifts and to do what God's called them to do. God gives these people to every church. And I believe he gives lots of these people to every church. And according to verse 3, these people will have three spiritual characteristics. Now the first one, I don't know why this is true, doesn't show up in the NIV that we read together. But trust me, it's in the Greek, it's in every other biblical translation. But the first spiritual characteristic these people will have to share is that they will be well-respected well-respected within their congregation and their community. The New Living Translation states it, And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. You've got to be respected by the people that you're trying to lead. The second characteristic is that these people will be full of the Holy Spirit. No matter how good of an administrator you are, no matter how good of a speaker you are, no matter how well-respected you are, you can't lead God's people in the right direction unless you're leading and being guided by the Spirit. And then the third spiritual characteristic is that they will be wise. Now, wise or wisdom in the Bible doesn't mean smart. It doesn't mean knowing a lot of stuff. Wisdom in the Bible is the God-given ability to make choices and decisions based on the will of God. A wise person makes their choices and their decisions. A wise leader in the church makes choices and decisions based not on popularity, not on politics, not on how well it may be received, but 
by following the will of God and the will of God alone. So anyone called to administration, to leading and doing hands-on ministry, will be well-respected, they will be full of the Spirit, and they will have biblical wisdom. And the disciples found seven such men, presented them to the apostles who, who uh, committed them to ministry. And, and please note, administration is a ministry. There is no hierarchy of gifts. We've talked about this before. Administration is not a lower task than preaching and teaching. Administration is not a lower task than some other types of service, than having a musical gift or having the spiritual gift of money, which we've talked about, is a spiritual gift. Administration is a gift that frees others to use their gifts. Administration is seen in the trustees when they wisely manage our financial issues. It's seen in the deacons when they take communion to people who can't come to church on Sunday. Administration is seen in our mission board when they prayerfully help us support our missionaries. Administration is seen in the people who clean and prepare our facility for Sunday morning and for other activities. Administration is seen in the people who prepare the tech for the early service. And those may seem like stretches to you, but I know churches where all of that stuff is the pastor's responsibility. And those churches are dying and the pastors are burning out. And I can tell you stories of pastoral divorces and alcoholism, and a lot of it comes from just this expectation. I'm not excusing them, but the pressure, a feeling that everything is on their shoulders. So the gift of administration in its broadest sense is seen anytime someone in the church takes on the leadership or the doing of a hands-on ministry that frees the pastor and other teachers and others within the congregation to use their gifts for ministry. And I'll say what I've said before, because I know what some people are thinking. When we've talked about the pastor's primary role of that of being preacher, teacher, and equipper, this is not about taking responsibilities off of the pastor's to-do list so his job is easier. And so he has to work fewer hours each week. This is about everybody in the body of Christ exercising the gifts and doing the ministry that God's called them to so that everyone else is free to do the same. This issue's come up a few times in this series and that's because it is so important to being a healthy church. A pastor has to be free to do what a pastor's called to do. And you have to be free to do what God has called you to do. If you're a square and we try to shove you in a circle hole, well, we're not doing you any good and we're not recognizing the gifts that God has given to you. Amazing things happen when everybody is allowed to use their gifts and to do the ministry God's called them to. Let's look at uh, verse seven the last verse in our passage for this morning, to see what happens when those with the gift of administration, of leading and, and doing hands-on ministry, do what God's gifted them to do, and then those who preach and teach and others are able to do what they're called to do. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Priests had opposed Jesus when he was still alive. They were opponents of Christianity. And yet, because the church was working together and everybody was putting their gifts to use and the apostles were able to preach and teach, even these hardcore opponents were becoming converted to Christianity. That's like, I don't know, an atheist, a hardcore agnostic, something or other coming to faith today simply because you've exercised your gift. Well, God blessed their actions. He blessed them because the apostles were able to preach and teach. He blessed them because people who up to this point may not have been using their gifts were putting their gifts into action. So the word was spread, people came to Christ, and even the priests were being converted. Wise administration, leading and doing hands-on ministry enhances the sharing of the gospel. It makes the church healthier. It enhances everything we do. Outreach, evangelism, everything we do beyond these four walls. I was in Michael's craft store 
on Friday. Yes, I go to craft stores. I also wear purple shirts. Um, but when I'm in craft stores, I buy the most manly item you can buy in a craft store. Paracord. Okay? So I was in Michael's, and there were a few of us in line, but there was only one clerk. And you could just kind of feel tension in the air because the clerk was overwhelmed. She was doing everything. She was ringing people out, and she was answering the phone, and she was calling for help on the intercom. And those of us in line were a bit impatient. Nobody said or did anything, but you could just feel the tension. All of us were thinking, why doesn't this place hire more employees? We have important places to be. There was a tension and frustration that you could feel. And when another clerk showed up and opened a second register off to the side, then the change in the atmosphere was palpable. The few of us in line, we smiled a little easier. Uh, we felt a great sense of gratitude to this, this uh, new clerk who had showed up to help. And the, the tension and frustration that we were all feeling as we stood there waiting for someone to come and help us, it, it dissipated. Well, there is a spiritual tension and a spiritual frustration that the people of the world live in as they wait for someone to come and help them. It is palpable and they can feel it. And there is a spiritual side to our life, a supernatural side to our life as disciples and as a church that we sometimes lose sight of. But it is even more important than the tangible stuff we can see and hear and feel. Paul writes in Ephesians 6.12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is the water in which we swim, and yet we are often unaware of it. Lost people are unaware of it too, but they live in it and they experience it as this spiritual tension and frustration. They experience it as depression, as anxiety, as loneliness. They experience it as hopelessness, joylessness, meaninglessness, self-worthlessness, they experience it as just this general malaise, which is an unfocused, unnameable feeling that something is just wrong or missing or broken in life. They can feel the tension and the frustration. And they try to deal with this through alcoholism and through drugs and through the misuse of sex. People try to deal with this through retail therapy, which is going out and spending money just in the hopes that will make you feel better. They try to deal with this tension and disappointment through uh, the drive for success, the belief that if I can just get that corner office, I'll be happy. They try to deal with this through serial marriages, the belief that if I can just find the right spouse, he or she will make me happy. They try to deal with this tension and frustration through online addictions and, and pornography. And in the worst situations, they try to deal with the tension and frustration by considering suicide. That's how heavy this spiritual malaise is. And the only solution to the tension and frustration that the world lives in is Jesus Christ. The only answer, the only cure, the only way to lift the malaise and the tension and the frustration is Jesus Christ. But the people who need him most cannot put that into words. They can't state, I need Jesus Christ. That's why they're trying all these other things that don't work. All they know is that something is wrong or missing or broken, and they need somebody to do something about it. And this is where we come in. And this is where administration becomes as exciting to me as worship and evangelism and discipleship. We are God's plan for defeating the spiritual tension and frustration and malaise that the world lives in. Yes, we do this as individuals. You know, you have friends and family that you deal with one-on-one. -on -one. But the best approach 
to dealing with a spiritual issue like this is a united church, a wisely administered church where everyone is using their gifts and everyone is free to do what God has called them to do. A church where the pastor or other leaders are bogged down by too many expectations, where people are not using their gifts is useless in this battle. But a wisely administered church where each person is doing what God has called them to do brings a palpable sense of relief to the world when we exercise the ministry of Jesus Christ. The good news, as in Acts chapter 6 verse 7, the good news gets spread and new people come to Christ. That's okay. <laughs> the word gets spread and new people come to Christ. And as when, on a lower level, that second clerk showed up and the change in the attitude was palpable and she brought this feeling of relief. So does the church. And yet even more than that, we bring healing and we bring salvation. We, we can bring Christ to the depressed and the anxious and the hopeless and the joyless and the self-worthless and those running after they don't know what. We can bring Christ to those who are trying to fix their lives through alcohol and drugs and the misuse of sex and overeating and online dependency and again, in the worst case scenarios, the suicidal. We can bring Christ into the spiritual frustration and tension that everybody in the world lives in. And we do this best when we are all using our gifts and doing what it is that God has called each of us to do. Amen. I used to hate to steal terms from the business world, but I guess on a day when we preach about administration, it's appropriate. Uh, the word synergy, you know, it's been overused for the last decade, but the idea that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. You and I work off one another, and you and the leaders work off one another. When I do what God's called me to do, you leave Sunday mornings better equipped what God has called you to do. And that frees me up to do what God has called me to do, etc., etc., etc. And then as in Acts 6, 7, the word is spread and more people come to faith in Christ. Go in peace, to love, and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.